Hey, hi everyone. Um, glad to see you again. Uh, last week we took a little bit of a break, primarily because we were a little more busy than we were expecting, um, but we are back on track for the series. Um, sorry, these glasses are a little foggy. Um, so today uh, I wanted to kind of dive into something that I don't think it's talked about too much, at least like as a resource for, oh man, here's all over the place, um, to mostly be talking about uh, like hardware um, that artists can use that like actually helps artists and like understanding how to use hardware and devices uh, that will help you as an artist as part of your artist practice. Um, but uh, like talk about it in a way that is actually helpful to your practice and not something that like is extremely technical or purely for commercial reasons, but something you can actually apply to what, what you do as an artist. And uh, I honestly don't think there's enough resources out there for that, this, at least like in terms of information. As soon as you dive into it, it'll just be some dude talking about how like <laughs> he got his like 56 inch TV hooked up to like a server with like movies that he pirated and all this stuff. And really, honestly, like the artist is probably just trying to figure out how to uh, work with equipment so that they can actually execute their concept or their design that they're trying to create. Um, so, uh, so today I'm, I'm going to be talking about that. Surprise. <laughs> so hopefully this will help you out. Um, I'm hoping it's going to shed some light on some tools that maybe you have not heard of, uh, as well as ones that you maybe already are familiar with, but don't know entirely too much about, or would like to hear about from somebody else who's worked with them. Um, so I think there's going to be something here for everybody. Um, so, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let me just check real quick. Hey. A couple of people on Instagram just doubled up the stream. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is going to be split into two different categories primarily. And then like, we're going to talk about something additionally at the end, but, uh, it's, I'm going to split the discussion about hardware and devices between um, consumer available products, so stuff you can just buy like on a, at a online at a store, or um, or that's easily easy to buy and like anybody can pick it up and get it from somebody who who supplies it. And then um, from there, I'm going to talk about then like DIY projects, so do-it-yourself projects that. Uh, use some form of technology that is actually consumer, like you'll be able to buy it also, but you'll need to do a little bit more research and um, some like, uh, and understand the tools a bit more, but I'm going to present it in a way that's still like going to be artist friendly and tools that as an artist, even if you don't know how to work with these type of things will still be very useful to you um, because they're, they're created to be accessible and like flexible. So, Controls a little bit weird. Okay, so like I said, uh, consumer products we're going to talk about first. So I'm going to go from kind of the more known about to the more obscure as they go down, as well as like, um, um, like I'm trying to get it so one thing relates to the next when I go from to each thing. Um, so, so the first one, this is this might be a no-brainer to some of you, but for for me is primarily like having set up a lot of shows that use electronics, um, uh, these things, so surge protectors or power strips, uh, even if you're not gonna use these in like your, your installation or your piece, uh, as part of your equipment as an artist, I think you should always have one of these on hand, um, primarily because uh, when you've created something that maybe uses electricity or you just need to like extend it, um, for their, somewhere else, you want to get a power strip or a surge protector uh, because then if, you know, Florida has lightning and sometimes, you know, you, you can, it can knock out things you have if, uh, if you don't have a surge protector or something that will, um, will disconnect your, your, uh, 
your devices or your piece that you've created uh, so it doesn't fry what you made and then you have to go out and buy something new. So if you use any, any electric things in your stuff, like again, this might be a no brainer, but I do recommend even if you're like right next to a plug, connect it to a surge protector before you go into the wall. Um, you'll, you probably won't ever have a problem with it, but this is kind of a nice safety net that um, I think every artist should definitely have in their, their, um, their equipment. So the next one is uh, microcomputers. So we know that, um, like I know not everybody uses or will need a computer. You might need this for like playing media or you have, again, like interactive software. I'm not expecting everybody has that, but um, if you decide that you need to have a computer in your setup that you, is either Windows, um, like um, uh, OS X, or what I mean is like a Macintosh, um, or Apple, I should say. Um, you can go with a, a mini or micro computer. Um, I actually have one here. Let me see. Beep, beep, beep. Oh, I switched the wrong one. Where is it? There it is. So I just actually recently got this. So this is like a little tiny computer. It's really small. So you, like my hands, got my sausage fingers. Um, like it's really not that that big. And um, they, these actually come with uh, mounts that you can attach to, like if you're going to put it behind a TV. Um, so these are really awesome. They tend to be in the price range of about $200 to, to from like $200 to, um, you can go pretty high up with it, like $700, if, especially if you get a, uh, a Macintosh like you see here. Um, so... Uh, you might be paying a lot for this. And again, this I think will be more outside of the artist's budget, depending on if you have a grant or, or not. But um, I'm going to talk about some things that will probably make a computer less relevant to what you're doing um, because there's other options that are cheaper, uh, especially if you're going to be doing video. But understand that microcomputers exist. Uh, Macintosh sells a Mac Mini. If you decide to get a, a Macintosh Mac Mini, I recommend you look up buying um, refurbished. You, you, because you get a Macintosh does not mean you need it to be up to date because most refurbished computers are within the um, uh, like one to five year range of when it was released. Uh, Macintosh sells, or Apple I should say, it sells their um, computers uh, refurbished. Just look online for refurbished uh, Macintosh computers. You can also, buy from an authorized reseller of Apple computers as refurbished. Um, and they come out a lot cheaper than buying them new, uh, which will actually be a lot nicer to your budget. Just keep in mind that if you decide to go Apple, you are gonna be paying more than you have to, where you can see with these other, trying to figure out how I can point to these, these computers, which are either Windows or Linux based, um, those, the one I just showed uh, runs really nicely and it cost me under uh, $300. Um, you can get, actually get it cheaper, probably like 200. Um, but you do have to buy it in parts. Usually you have to buy a hard drive and RAM for it, um, which I can explain later if you guys have questions. Um, but uh, it's really simple to set up. It just will take a little bit more time, but the trade-off is, is that you save like um, probably like $400 at least. So you could buy two of these for the price of a Macintosh. So keep that in mind. Again, these are not, not friendly to, to everybody's budget um, and they might not be relevant because you might not need this much power for what you're doing. Okay, moving on. Um, so then, then diving into, again, this might be widely known already, but media players are uh, a, a a video artist as well as like a um, photo or anybody who's using a projector uh, is going to be your best friend getting a media player. So with media players, you can just put in a USB um, that has a uh, has your media files, so video, pictures. Um, I think you can put music too if you wanted to. Uh, so you can put a USB, an SD card, uh, and then it connects with an HDMI to the TV and it has its own little menu to play specific things or just one thing on a loop. 
Um, one thing I really recommend though, they, uh, if you're gonna buy one of these, try to get the bigger ones. I know that sounds like counterintuitive, but the smaller they are, they have a tendency to break a lot easier. Uh, this is me talking from experience. We've I've used a really wide range of media players over the years, working at museums as well as like personal work and non for profit work. Um, and the small ones tend to almost always break. Uh, the case I don't know what it is. It's the casing or just how it's manufactured. There's always a problem with them. Where with these larger ones, if that, there's a problem with it, um, usually it's easy to know what happened like it fell or broke or something. Um, but most of the time these are pretty super sturdy. Uh, they don't have problems. So like if you see a really tiny one, stay away from it, it'll be nice. But if you see like a medium size, like actually I forgot, I have one right here. So the one you're seeing in the picture here, um, actually have that here, just have our um, interactive initiative marked so we don't lose it. Um, you, you would want to get something like this, probably something about the size of your palm, roughly. Uh, it's uh, it's really key also, if you want to save yourself headaches, to get something that has the, uh, the buttons on it, because most of these only have remotes that, uh, that work with it. But if you lose that remote, then you can't use the media player anymore. And with the buttons, you're, you'll be able to since you know you move around a lot of artwork and stuff and you're going to lose some things at some point if you lose that remote you can still use the media player because it has all the buttons you need to to use it um uh regardless of like what you have at the moment so i think that's a really key thing that i don't think it's talked about quite a bit um but yeah media players they're great uh, i think that you can get them like a decent price would be about $30, 20 to 30. Um, they can go up way higher. Usually you don't need to go get super fancy unless you have like some really high end project. You can get a rinky dink one or one that you might feel like is a rinky dink and it'll probably do what you need to. Just keep in mind again, that the smaller it is, the more likely it is to break or stop working just randomly. <laughs> I speak for my own pains. So um, moving on. So uh, once you have your media player or computer set up, uh, it, if you plan on having like, let's say most multiple projectors, or you'd like to have the same image on multiple screens, you could get a signal splitter or an HDMI um, splitter. Uh, these usually have like an HDMI coming out of it that then um, has a extra HDMI ports that you connect to that then go to the, your other TVs. Um, they sell them in a wide range. Usually the cheaper ones have just two outputs to your TVs or projectors. Uh, and the more expensive ones have uh, multiple ones. You don't need to get super fancy ones of this as well. Um, just keep in mind they, the prices can like range quite a bit. Uh, just don't do something that's gonna break your bank. <laughs> uh, keep in mind too, most of these draw power. So you're gonna have to plug these into a surge protector or a wall, or depending on what you're doing. So keep that in mind when you're planning to use one of these as well. Um, another tool uh, that uh, I, I, I haven't really used, I have one of these, but it it's, uh, might be useful to somebody who it has limited output on their computer or doesn't even have like an HDMI or VGA or DVI output from their computer to connect to a screen. You can get these uh, external video graphics adapters, which actually plug straight into your USB. And then they, they have like a little HDMI out or some other thing that uh, connects to a video. So you, through your USB, you can actually then send video signal out to, to a screen. So the, the use for this would be, like I said, um, not having an HDMI port or video output from your computer, like a laptop might, if you have an older one, it might not have this. Uh, another good thing would be, maybe you do have like an HDMI output, but you wanna have an additional screen also, like like a, an extra one. So you have maybe like two extra screens coming out of your device. Um, this is a, a really good thing to do that. So that then creates like a whole new 
video output for you to work with. So it's a good tool to have, um, especially if you're working with computers. It's something a lot of people don't know about, I think. Um, next is uh, MIDI controllers. So I, I don't know, I forget what the acronym for MIDI means. I'm sure if you're a musician, you actually know what that stands for. But uh, my understanding is that MIDI is like a type of signal that you can send out to a, a, dip, a bunch of different types of programs. A lot of these these signals that get sent out are what are considered analog. So like um, if you see in the upper right, the upper right here, this is the one with the knobs and the buttons, uh, those, those are little push pads that light up that can actually connect to your computer. That thing is like about the size of a, the width of a laptop. Um, and you can, and they're pressure sensitive. So you can actually like hook this up to a program that like, let's say, um, shoots a light out of your projector and depending on how hard you press that button. So if you press it real lightly, you have like a dim little light, but then you can hit it real hard and the light will like burst even stronger. Um, the same thing can be said about the keyboard. The keyboard is, it sends out MIDI signals. Uh, this little drum set that you can get off of like uh, Amazon, I think for a hundred bucks uh, has their, their pads are also like analog based. So you can, um, depending on how hard you hit it, it sends the signal stronger or weaker. Um, th these these are really good um, if you're a live performer or a performance artist, uh, because you can set up uh, somebody, one of the performers to actually like do some visual stuff on the spot um, as you are um, doing your performance in some way. It's also good for, you can actually use this to then make modifications to maybe an art installation with lights or a system that you have. Um, the way you would do that is, uh, is by using some software, uh, primarily projection mapping software. There's a large number of them. I'll, I'll probably be doing a talk on it later, but you can, you can connect these MIDI pads to, uh, or a MIDI controller to, um, to these projection mapping pieces of software uh, to then like, you can turn a knob and then maybe like an effect like get stronger or weaker. The, ni the nice thing about this is that the MIDI controllers or pads are, are not like predefined what they do. You as the user actually like decides what affects what, uh, what knob does what to the thing you've created. So you have a ton of control over every aspect of what you see. So you, so you can do everything from uh, turning in like a knob to speed up some video that you have um, in in what you're projecting, uh, you then also can like make lines thicker or video get more distorted or change the size and scale depending on what you're doing and what things you're pressing. Um, so you have a ton of hands-on control that happens like live in real time. Um, this is often used. Th these these like pads are mostly used for by musicians. But um, what they call like visual jockeys or VJs, um, you use them with projection mapping software to then like, you know, when you go to the club and like you get the, the stuff is like going with the music into the beat. And that's the VJ basically like setting up a routine and like doing these effects that they pre-made, but then like are affected by these little MIDI controllers that then they play with. It's like their instrument for the visuals. Um, oh, let me just check this real quick. Um, so then the, the other, uh, the other thing that you have too with MIDI controllers, you don't necessarily have to buy those, uh, controllers that I showed uh, the ones that I, I forgot to mention. These are kind of more of the budget friendly ones. Um, the one in the upper right, uh, actually is about like $50, I would say, and is a, you can get a lot out of it. Uh, but the more fancier and the more um, precise uh, you get for it, they tend to cost quite a bit more. So you usually jump from 50 to 100 and like 300, depending on how crazy and how many knobs and things you want going on. Um, but I would recommend you start with the $50 one, play with that and then jump into something else and then work with your visual, um, like your uh, projection mapping software. Uh, if you really want to like test it out without having to buy new equipment, you can actually download some apps for your, uh, your, uh, your iPhone or iPad, as well as like a, an Android tablet or phone. And you can connect these via USB to your computer and they act the same way as like a, as a 
a MIDI pad would. And you have all the knobs and like things that you can play with. It gives you the same control. It just has a different interface and um, it's digital. So you're, you're not limited, but you don't have a tactile like feel to everything. And uh, I'm not sure the price ranges on these, but it should be a pretty wide range, depending on like how professional you get with it or not. Um, something else too that you can use both with um, with uh, with the visual with like um, if you're going to be doing projection mapping um, or not is uh, a webcam is pretty awesome, especially with like what we're doing now. You probably have one built in on your laptop that you can use. Uh, my current setup actually right now is using this program called OBS. It's called the OBS stands for Open Broadcast Software. Um, it's entirely free. Uh, it's what I'm doing or using to do these presentations every week uh, with just my laptop uh, camera. You can get some pretty nice cameras um, that are useful, but like. But outside of that, speaking about like if you have a performance piece that maybe takes time, like let's say you're doing something that's like a 48 hour piece or something that like maybe you're you're um, have a surveillance or um, people can like jump in on like a YouTube stream and observe like something that you're streaming. You can have uh, a webcam hooked up and like connected somewhere else. You could like have a really long cable and like put it on your window ledge and then set up your camera however you want, and then have it go connect to OBS on your computer, and it'll spit it out to uh, YouTube. Uh, it'll um, put it out on Facebook, or depending on what it is that you want, you can set it up for that, and it's entirely free. You just need the computer, uh, a camera, a webcam of some sort, um, and just time to set it up. And you can create these little custom inter interfaces and um, things that, that you see, like that I have set up every time here, like with me up in the corner. Whee! <laughs> um, again, that might be a common thing, but the OBS software, I think, is not something that everybody knows about. So just look up OBS, and then you can download it, and I think it works both on Mac and PC. Uh, again, this might be uh, something that's known by quite a few people, but I think it's still good to talk about. Um, kind of like what I was saying about with the, the webcam, uh, you, you shouldn't be limited to where your equipment is located. You can get um, extenders to connect further away from your computer or um, equipment that you're using. So if you have a webcam, but you want it to be like outside by your bird feeder or something, you can um, get a wireless extender or a wired cable. Usually the wired cable tends to be a bit more reliable. Um, and you can get these pretty long, get like 100 feet, I think. You can probably go higher than that. Um, you can get these wireless senders or wireless ones as well, which might be good also for like um, uh, performance. If you need like somebody in the crowd with a laptop or something, you can then like hook up that laptop HDMI to all the way up to um, a screen that's like really far from the performance and still, and they'll be able to move around and not be stuck to one station if they, if your performance needs something like that. So just know that that's an option. You're not limited by the distance um, other than the distance of like your wireless signal and your, your cable that you have. Um, one other thing too, that's also, I, I don't think is tapped into often. I've seen some artists actually use this and I think it, it's a smart and easy to work with tool. If you're like a performance artist or um, a live artist uh, that needs like visuals or imagery that changes when they need it, uh, you can set up a PowerPoint presentation with videos in it or imagery, and you can do your performance and set something up uh, where either somebody's backstage or um, or you can have something hidden in an object that you have that has a keyboard or whatever you want to do to advance to the next slide or jump around to where you need to. Um, this is a really ni nice way to to have an easy ch setup that you can change it whenever you need it, need it rather than, um, you know, you might be projecting like a jungle and then suddenly you're in, in another scene where you're, you're on the moon. So this would be an easy way to switch those scenes by projecting your PowerPoint and then switching to the next slide. So I, I think that's something that might be useful. Um, another thing, again, this might be well known as well, but I, I find uh, the easiest to set up as well as like being flexible 
and happy with like how sound is with the pieces, uh, primarily with like art installations and, and maybe performances, uh, would be getting a sound bar. Um, some of them are not too cheap. You can get something pretty decent with a hundred dollar sound bar. Um, or you can probably find um, a refurbished one somewhere. Uh, but you can kind of ha- hide these or put these in things uh, tucked away. And depending on the quality of the sound bar, uh, you'll be able to get some pretty good sound uh, as well as um, uh, like maybe some bass that you need that maybe like PC speakers or a smaller set of speakers wouldn't fulfill. Oh, and, and, and two, a lot of these two have a wireless capability. So you could like, if you need a soundtrack, you could Bluetooth wirelessly connect to um, these speakers pretty easily. Um, something else too, and again, this is like a little bit much in terms, let me move myself. We will. Um, <laughs> great acting. Um, something I think as uh, primarily for uh, either sculptors or uh, like that's kind of the initial thing that you're probably going to think I'm talking about, but mostly for artists that are looking to make art installations. Um, I think picking up a VR headset or using one, if you have the option, uh, is a really good choice because uh, you'll be able to actually build quick sketches due to the nature of how intuitive and quickly you can kind of draw in 3D space. Uh, the benefit of this is that you can get a, a sketch quickly made um, that uh, that actually has like physical presence and you know how things are laid out spatially. So you can actually plan out your, your artist installation or space and see it in full 3D and walk around it and see it, what is best and, and worst about it or like what you need to figure out spatially. Um, this actually gives you, lets you be in that space and, and see it um, happen um, in a way that that your brain automatically like figures it out spatially as opposed to purely drawing a sketch and just being like, I think it's gonna turn this way. Um, so I think this should be considered a tool for concept, uh, making your idea uh, for an installation or a sculptural piece and seeing how it will most likely and closest feel like to be in that space and, and to work with or how people will approach the piece. Um, th- these are also good tools for, uh, so tilt brush and medium are like two, two of the tools that are good for, uh, for doing this. The, the Oculus Quest is the actual headset. Um, it, it's about $400. Uh, you can probably buy some, well, right now because of the pandemic, it's actually probably a little bit more expensive if you buy it secondhand. Um, but if you have a budget for like a $400 headset, you, you pretty much can't go wrong with getting this. Um, uh, keep in mind also, you'll be able to like create, if you ever wanted a 3D model, you can actually 3D model in this and export your files to then be able to be like 3D printed or, um, or used for somebody else to like fabricate the piece for you because they have the actual 3D model to work with. So I think that's also another nice thing because the tools become more intuitive and less complex for you as a user. Um, Sorry, I keep looking away. I'm just checking on the Instagram feed. Okay. Um, one other tool, I think this is the last of my consumer tools. Uh, when you're planning, like when you're scoping out a space to, uh, to let me move myself. Whoa. <laughs> um, when you're scoping out a space to, uh, to install in or to, uh, to do again, like a performance, or you need to see like, how you're going to hang one of your paintings or just something in the case of where you need to figure something out spatially, but maybe you don't have the tools with you. Uh, it's good to always have a measuring app um, on your phone that uses like augmented reality. So if you look up in like the, the iTunes app store or the Android like play store and you look up I- AR measuring augmented reality measuring, um, you should get a whole list of different apps. Uh, some paid, some free, uh, that will actually do measurements for you uh, while you're in the space. You can actually get exact measurements. Uh, I don't have the names of them right now, primarily because there are so many of them, Uh, but I would definitely recommend having one of them on your phone to get rough estimates. Some of these are more accurate than others, and most of that's gonna come 
with you uh, spending time with the different applications. So I think this is just a good tool to have uh, always on your phone, just ready to go when you don't expect to to like be able to when you're you know you might not always have the tools tools or measurement tools to to do what you need to in the moment. And I think this calculates a lot for you that saves you time. All right, so now again, let me check on this. Okay, we're good on Instagram. Um, I'm gonna jump into the DIY. And what I mean mostly by DIY is that these are still gonna be consumer products, but like less something you go to a store and get and more things that you buy um, specific parts or things to do very specific things. <laughs> Sounds really repetitive, but it's true. Um, and you'll find you'll actually have a lot more power to do things with this on a very small budget that you have. Um, and, uh, and the stuff you can do is way cooler than I think most people realize they can do because the tools have gotten so much easier than they used to be, even if you don't understand most of how this stuff works. So uh, first, I want to talk about a tool that I really want artists to start using. Uh, like, I think a lot of cosplay people, I shouldn't say people, but groups of cosplay uh, use this uh, to add like lights and things to their, their outfits or have um, interactivity to it. Uh, the Circuit Playground Express is a really cool little circuit board. I actually have one right here. Uh, I'm going to show you something in a sec. Uh, you it, it, you can program for it, and it only takes uh, it it takes multiple types of programming languages. But the default one is actually something I've talked about before, where it's visual scripting. So you actually have like stacks of Legos that you connect, and with that you can create things that create sound. They can pick up, use a microphone that's built into it, has a temperature sensor. You can use the lights and program them. Um, it has a speaker on it, has buttons that have input that you can do, and um, a light sensor, I think, it has a couple other things. And just because it has that doesn't mean you can extend, can't extend it further, because you can then connect this to other things, like other sensors, like a flex sensor, which checks like how far you bend stuff. Um, you can even hook it up to speakers to make it louder. You can see here, like I have the, all the fruit and stuff. This guy, I think, made a musical instrument out of uh, different types of fruit. Um, so you can do a lot of things with this, and it's super cheap. Uh, I got I got mine for roughly around twenty five to thirty dollars. Um, uh, these are great. I really recommend getting multiple ones after you've gotten at least like one to play with. Uh, let me jump to the next slide. So this is what the, the, the programming language looks like. You don't even need to install anything on your computer. You just go to this website, make your code, and then you download it and put it on the device. So in literally like five minutes before upstream, I made something real quick. Um, it took me less than a minute to make. Let me switch here. Um, so with my thing, this is going to be a little bit brinky dink. I have... I have a uh, the battery, so this it's turning on now. Oop. So it, this whole thing um, does everything I needed to, and I'll, I set it to react to loud sounds. So, oop. so every time I click my hands, it'll. And it took me less than a minute to program that, and you don't even really need to know how to program to get something up and working. And I can do so much more than what I did here. So you could connect this to like motors if you wanted to, which, which I've done a couple times. So I could like click my hand um, or fingers uh, and then it outputs the signal to the motor. Then you can have the motor do something that you can then place in um, uh, like something that you've created to move. Uh, it could do another sound, it could do um, something else. You can even have it where it like set, does multiple sensors at once to make sure maybe somebody's in the room. Um, the nice thing too about if you go to this website as well, you can it has a bunch of tutorials on how to make things. They have preset, pre-made things. You can even take the stuff that they have and modify it to um, to do what you need to do. So uh, it's a really powerful little piece of hardware. It's mo it was originally created to teach people how to program um, and work with circuit boards. 
it's super accessible it's dirt cheap um and i recommend everybody gets one um especially with how much you can expand on it i'm, ho I'm hoping to put some leds whoop, just activate it again um some leds on it as well so i have like a long strand and you can you can even use uh some uh what do you call it some uh some like con some conductive uh, thread, and you can actually uh, sew these into like your clothing, and then um, those little pins that you see on the, the edges, you can like uh, extend it uh, with the conductive thread. So you can put little lights on that thread, or have like a motor connected somewhere else. So it's pretty cool. You can do a lot with this thing. So again, it's a what's it called? It's called a Circuit Playground Express. So look this up, Circuit Playground Express. You can get it on Amazon and as well as another website I'm gonna show in a little bit. Um, so another circuit board you can get, it's gonna be a little bit more pricey, is uh, uh, this thing called Bear Conductive. Uh, and what it does, uh, you can see in the upper right here, let me move myself out of the way. Um, you see the little pins. Like at the top there, uh, those pins actually uh, then connect to some paint that you have. They're, it's conductive paint, and you can program uh, your the circuit board to uh, like light up some lights or turn a sound on or maybe like to change the soundtrack. It depends on like what you do with it. It's a little bit more programming based. Uh, it's not insanely complicated to work with. Uh, just understand that you could have like an object that is painted that maybe somebody doesn't realize is actually interactive in some way. And they go and like touch like an arm on it and suddenly it activates this thing that's connected to it um, by using this conductive paint. Uh, you're not limited by paint also, there's some other options you can do too. But um, the coolest I've seen work with it is working with the condu conductive paint. So um, check that out, I think it's worth seeing. Let's see. Okay, so another thing that I, a lot of artists I think should be using too, um, that's a little more complicated again, but again, it's still pretty accessible, is, uh, is the Arduino. It's an Italian named uh, circuit board. It's the circuit board that you can program and um, uh, the, uh, sorry, brain fart. Um, the, you can, it's a circuit board that's not set to be a specific thing. You can connect it to like LEDs, motors. It's, it's a very similar to the um, uh, the Playground Express that I showed, except it's more technical. You can do a lot more with it. You can see in the, the picture down here that, um, that it's connected to actually a plant and it has a moisture sensor. Um, so you can tell when the plant needs to be watered. Some people actually take it further and um, you, you can then have an automate like a hydroponic system. Um, like the, a way to think about it is it's a really good tool to then like extend having like motors and sensors that work with it. Uh, you can do a lot of things with it. It's like a more powerful, uh, but it does take time to learn. Uh, but it's again, it's also super affordable and everything is available online. And they have like at this website, they have like some examples that you can use uh, and like kind of break down. But it, it doesn't take long to learn and you can do a lot with it. There's a lot of extensibility or thick ways you can extend it. Um, so check it out. These are also really cheap. I think they're about thirty five dollars and they go on up to like a hundred from there. Um, they might actually be cheaper, too, but make sure you check that out. Um, I'm going to move myself. Um, the other options that you have too, like working with your, your, uh, Playground Express or the, the Arduino, you can get these sensors, uh, so you can have like a knob, like a potentiometer it's called, or, uh, what you see with the hand there, that's a the flex sensor, which actually sends signals based on like how far something is bending. Um, I use this on something in grad school for my dog that depending on how far back he bent his neck. Um, he would actually talk to different people, so it would play a random sound clip. Um, so that's pretty cool. That little like black thing on the circuit board that at the bottom that you see, um, that is like a sonic rangefinder. So that sends out like sound waves 
And when it gets interrupted at a certain point, you can have it then like um, uh, trigger something. So it's like a, you can make like a house security system if you wanted with that or have it activate a sound piece or turn something on. Um, there's also like this big arcade button. So you could have switches or buttons that connect to it. Um, you can even have your Arduino cooked up to your computer and have one of these things like the arcade button. Um, when it gets pressed, then it would send like a keyboard signals, so like a space bar, which would be good for if you're doing like a PowerPoint presentation. Um, you could then like somebody hits it and it advances to the next slide. Uh, so you have a lot of options on it. The best place to probably buy it is in the website that I have at the bottom here, adafruit.com. Um, again, they sell that Playground Express as well, and uh, as well as tools that you can use. All right, just keep looking back to see if Instagram is still going. <laughs> okay, so um, another option, and again, this is gonna be a bit more complicated again, uh, but is a good option as an artist if you are on a really low budget and you need your own personal computer or um, want to use a computer alongside your Arduino or something else, uh, you can get a Raspberry Pi which are what they call single board computers, SBCs, uh, where it just literally looks like the circuit board that you see on the screen. And, um, and uh, with that, you it has everything you need for a computer. The only thing you need to provide, I think, is like a mouse and keyboard and a micro SD card, which you just put into it. And um, you put your own like operating system software on there. Uh, it has its own type of thing that you have to use called like Raspbian. Um, if you've ever gone to like those, um, like a retro arcade bar, uh, and they have those like bar top things that have multiple games to play, it's probably one of these computers that are, are running it. Um, they're really powerful. They're also dirt cheap as well. They were originally created to get people interested in computer science. It was more of a student thing um, that was, they wanted to have it affordable as well as like powerful at the same time. A lot of people use these for, for gaming emulation um, and like home theater setups, uh, but you can just use it as a, a computer for what you need. And uh, even though it's limited, you can, um, you can do video editing, you can do graphics editing, you can do web browsing. Um, and it starts from about $35 all the way up to, I think like $50 in terms of just buying the board. Um, it's really useful. I have my my own. I use it for my own projects. It's in a case right now. Um, you can see it's in here. Um, it's really cool. You can connect it to multiple computers. If you need an extra computer in the house, but on a shoestring budget, definitely get one of these. Um, there's a lot of fun to be had with them. Uh, and you can hook them up to Arduinos and multiple things. But with that being said, you can go to this website, um, the instructables.com slash circus, circuit, circus, Raspberry Pi, pro and then slash projects. Um, and they'll come up with all these projects that you can do that are a lot more complex uh, in terms of what they can do to have um, to create stuff. Like you can see here, you can create your own like dr drone that uses a Raspberry Pi. And it's probably gonna much more affordable than buying one. Um, so you can do some really cool stuff with that. Okay, so moving on from like DIY projects um, uh, or items, I wanted to talk about some a couple of resources that I don't think artists are entirely aware of that are out there. Um, it's a short list, so um, bear with me. Um, this is mostly talking to Florida-based artists, but I think it, this is pretty much applies to uh, any artist that is uh, that has a local library around, uh, most libraries now provide a a um, a makerspace in some way or a computer lab that has some making capabilities. Uh, you can actually go to them, and I think at least like the ones that I've been to, they provide three D printing for free. And if not for free, it's it's a it's a lot more affordable, um, and it's. Uh, you know, it's the, the only cost that you have to have is I think having a library card uh, membership for for whatever district you're in. Um, I really recommend taking advantage of this to if you need to print anything or make something that 
uh, that you found. Um, I think I forgot to add the slide here, but actually, no, I think it's here. Um, you can download also like templates. So you might need something to hold the phone to then go with a performance or something that you have. You can get it 3, 3D printed. Um, just keep in mind that if you want a 3D print, usually there's like a waiting list. Uh, so you need to like submit your files to them sooner than later, because then like depending on how long that waiting list is, you might have to wait like from a week to a month to, to get, get your 3D print. But it's free, so that's the trade-off. If you don't have any 3D models to print, you can go to Thingiverse or Thingiverse, I don't know how to say it, uh, and download a 3D model to work with. Um, you can just grab these guys, and then um, uh, they're totally free. Ooh, sorry. Um, they're totally free and um, something that uh, I think everybody can find use for. Yeah. Um, and then uh, this is primarily targeted towards uh, people who want to work with more archival or uh, uh, um, like older media, uh, I recommend you check out archive.org. There's a lot of old, older films, like ephemeral films, they section it off. Uh, it's really well organized. You find really obscure stuff. Uh, if you're doing, um, if you need like some, some footage for a piece that you're working on, a lot of the stuff here is available for free and for, for public use. Um, there's, they also have software. So if you just wanna take a deep dive into like old MS-DOS retro computer games, you can actually go there and download the software or even just play the, the software in your, your browser itself. Um, you can get books, video, uh, you can get audio, software, images. It's a really good resource that I don't think a lot of artists talk about. Um, and you could probably spend a, an entire lifetime just like browsing in here. So if you love going to libraries or just getting old footage or whatever, you like media or want to use media in some way or you know collage stuff in, in whatever medium you work with this is a perfect site for you as an artist um and then uh to toot my own horn um uh another resource is is us uh interactive initiative uh you we we exist to uh, help local artists primarily in the south florida area to be able to work with these tools and understand them uh, we also, uh, when I say we, it's primarily me, but like, so you'd be talking most likely to me. Um, my name's Sam, by the way. Um, you uh, please contact us. Uh, a quick way is just like through Instagram or even Facebook. Uh, you can email us as well. Uh, we have different ways of contacting us through our website. Uh, so if you're curious on how, how to do something with uh, media, whether it be interactive, um, whether it be digital, video, or even like equipment where it's like projections. Um, we exist as a non-for-profit, not to benefit from you, but so that you can benefit from us. So we want to, we ex primarily exist to be a platform so that artists can actually um, not have to go through a lot of the pains that we have learned or have worked with and get them working faster and even better than, than what we've done in the past. So, um, so please use us when you can. Um, we are a resource and we want to be more resource to artists more often. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that is primarily what we do. Um, it, one way you can help us help you also is by filling out this survey. Um, so just, you can just go to this website and uh, fill up the whole thing. It's really short. You can give us input on stuff you want us to talk about. Uh, you can also ask us questions through this, um, but uh, we'll be able to cover topics that are sensitive to you or that you actually care about. So please do visit this website. Um, you can visit our website or um, please do fill out the survey. Uh, but that's primarily it for today. Um, um, thank you for joining me either on Instagram or here on YouTube. Um, next week, I'm, I'm still deciding what to do, what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but it will most likely have to do with uh, um, an interactive element, most li likely some game type of thing. It, uh, I'm debating it might be actually about something that's very less technical and more about how you work with creating mechanics. 
Um, but um, I'll get into that in the next week. But until next time, nice seeing you guys. I'll see you next week. Um, and have an awesome Thursday. Yay. Bye.